All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to pick back up on chapter 18 where we left off last week. And uh, we covered, uh, sh let's see, we were covering strokes and um, I think seizures. Yeah, we, we'd gone through seizures. I hadn't advanced far enough in my PowerPoint this morning. So let's talk, before I go any further, let's talk about seizures a little bit. What are... What are the three major categories of seizures that we recall? So we have absence seizures, partial seizures. Yeah, so I, I yeah, so there's four there's four different ones. So we have absence and partial. There's two more. Generalized and and pseudo seizures. Now, do any of those uh so somebody did I hear Pettit Mall? Somebody say Pettit Mall? So Pettit Mall seizures are absence, generally considered absence seizures. That's the same thing. Um you have your grand mal seizure, which is generalized, or your absent seizures, or your petit mal seizures, which are absent. Then you'll have your partial seizures. Partial seizures are uh, come in two different forms. Uh, what are the two different forms of at partial seizures? No, tonic and clonic are terms referring to generalized seizures, uh, grand mal. So two types of absence, or not absence, um, partial seizures. You have simple and you have complex. Simple and complex seizures, partial seizures, is a difference of altered mental status. So you can have a partial, uh, complex partial seizure where the patient is unresponsive or has an altered mental status and only part of their body is twitching or you can have a simple partial seizure where the patient does, does not lose consciousness but like their leg or their arm or the right side of their body or something like that is uh, uh, convulsing or twitching you also have febrile seizures um they are a generalized seizure. They are a grand mal seizure, but they are associated specifically with fevers. They present in children generally under six, uh, six and younger. Uh, most often present as uh, alone, you know, singularly. They're rarely repeated. However, a child who has had a febrile seizure is likely to have febrile seizures again in the future the next time they have a fever. What is that key... What is, what is a key aspect of a febrile seizure as being able to say um, why the fever, or excuse me, the seizure happens? Yeah, rapid change in temperature. It's not a matter so much of how high their temperature got as much as it's a concern with how quickly the temperature changed. Now, Obviously, a very high temperature can result in brain damage, and that's going to be a very different situation. But those are, you know, temperatures of like 106 and such like that. Basically, anything over 105 for an extended period of time. Um, so, but that's not normally what we're looking at. We're seeing, we see these with kids that have like 102, 103 fevers, and it's because almost always, again, it's not guaranteed, but it's almost always the result of their Tylenol or ibuprofen wearing off and their fever spiking in a very short period of time. I would recommend that you're familiar with the phases of seizures and what, um, how the patient presents during those phases. Tonic being a stiffening of the muscles, 
hypertonic being an overextension of the neck and spine, uh, so like an arching of the back and uh, things like that. And then you have the clonic phase where the muscles go limp. And then so where you get a tonic clonic seizure is that contraction, uh, relax, contract, relax, contract, relax. So stiff, limp, stiff, limp. That's the um, tonic clonic um, movement. And then post seizure phase, this is often the patient's mu skeletal muscles aren't moving, their general limbs are not, you know, body is not convulsing anymore. But if you open their eyes or try to open their eyes, you'll see that their eyelids are still fluttering, their eyes are twitching inside, they're rolled back in their head or something like that. So there's still seizure activity going on. It's just not manifesting in their extremities and throughout their whole body. Um, that is still treatable. You want to use Versed or Ativan, whatever your um, anticonvulsants are to stop that. Uh, and then they go to the postictal, their body will go fairly limp. They will start breathing at a regular rate again. They're generally altered into a significant extent and are um, <clears throat> uh, so they're not going to answer your questions. As they regain consciousness, they will become more and more, uh, they will be confused, but becoming more and more alert. What is a so while pseudo seizures are psychiatric in origin that doesn't mean that they are intentional and i've, I've pointed that out before but what is a common way of um, fixing a pseudo seizure yeah basically shocking them out of it grabbing their attention um like yo listen up and you know but another big key for it is getting out of the environment that they are in removing them from the family reunion the center of attention the stressful event whatever it happens to be get them out of that and th things will improve Yeah, it, it, and this is incredibly frustrating for us as providers because pseudo seizures do not require treatment with um, anoxalytics or um, anticonvulsants. Like, what are we, you know, there's nothing we're going to do with that. We don't even have to worry about their airway because, like, they're going to be sitting there staring at you and, like, I'm having a seizure. And you're like, you're full of crap. And, um, but, you know, that's just what it is. So they are very frustrating, but generally we want to approach it very similarly to how we would approach a patient who's having a panic attack, um, distract them, calm them down, remove them from the circumstances and such like that. Um, in fact, one day, um, while this isn't a recommendation to use placebos, because I didn't, I had a patient who I was pretty certain was doing pseudo seizures, uh, but he was really, really selling it well. Um, but my assessment of his like painful stimuli response and such like that was enough to indicate, yeah, this is pseudo seizure family standing right there. You're like, he has pseudo seizures. He does this all the time. <coughs> Excuse me. So we load him in the back of the ambulance. Doors are still open. Patient's family standing outside the ambulance. I'm like, well, it's a seizure. So we need to start an IV. What do you guys normally, um, or no, I, I said, do they normally, do they often have to give an IV? And they're like, yeah, sometimes at the hospital they do an IV and give a med. So I'm like, okay. And so start the IV, get the line. And I'm about to flush it, right? Put the INT cap on and I'm about to flush it with saline. And I turn around and ask the family, I said, hey, do they ever use Ativan to fix his seizures? And they're like, yeah, Ativan works really well for him. And I'm like, okay, so I'll see how this works as I flush the saline instantly instantly the seizure ends and he starts talking to me no postictal period no confusion instant seizure um uh, and it's like and he's back to normal i'm like oh cool well by the way that wasn't out of van that was saline i haven't given you any out of van so you know but um yeah sometimes pseudo seizures can be s solved uh, as simple as that. Did I hear a question? 
well, you know, we've, I've, uh, yeah, we've done with that one before as well. But I wasn't, I was intentionally, well, I wasn't intentionally trying to give him a placebo. Like that wasn't the focus there. I was just flushing the IV, but I was talking about benzos while I did it to see how it would work in that guy's head, and it did what I wanted it to. Um, so you'll notice here it says partial or excuse me, absent seizures are generally recognized in children. This is happens almost every single time you tell them they have to turn off their uh, video game or their um, clean up their room. They just kind of like stare blankly at you like you have two heads and they have no idea what you just said. Like so that you just get this blank. What? And so, yeah. If you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. All right, so um, how do we differentiate a seizure from a stroke? Well, obviously, while the patient is seizing, actively seizing, be it uh, partial or um, generalized, it's pretty obvious, right? There's the convulsion taking place. But if the patient is in that postictal period and fairly limp, it can be rather difficult to identify or maybe not so but it can be confusing is this a seizure or is this a you know is this the postictal period of a seizure or is this a stroke also sometimes seizures just like hypoglycemia can result in a uh, unilateral or localized paralysis and weakness so um you want to do a thorough assessment on their body. You know, do they have weakness on both sides of the body? What is their history? Have they ever had seizures before? Have they ever had a stroke before? Is unilateral weakness a concern with them? Um, evaluate their blood sugar. But um, that confusion and postictal period will generally change for the better, or they'll have another seizure, which seizures do not necessarily are not necessarily associated with strokes. While it is possible, it's not necessarily associated. So kind of look at that history. Were they having a headache prior to the seizure? Were they having slurred speech or difficulty prior to the seizure? Do they have a history of seizures? How did this seizure present compared to previous seizures? Um, and that, that kind of a thing. Hey, yep, yep, yep. All right, we talked about status epilepticus. Remember, seizures lasting more than four or five minutes and the patient or the patient having a seizure before regaining consciousness. Um, if a patient is seizing, if a pregnant patient is seizing, what are our options as far as the cause, the origin? So... Eclampsia is definitely one of those that should be forefront in our mind because the treatment of eclampsia is going to be magnesium. We're dealing with a patient who has essentially a toxic um, state. Their, their blood is in toxic state and um, I, not associated with toxic shock syndrome. I'm blanking on the exact term that they use. Um, toxicosis, I think. No, that's not the right word. Um, I'm, I'm blanking on it. So, but a preg a pregnant person may still or can still have a um or I should say a person with a history of epilepsy can get pregnant. So a pregnant woman could be having an epileptic seizure. So you want to look at that history. Uh, for years we've been recommending oh a pregnant patient who's seizing start with mag. Well, that's a great idea unless the patient has a history of um. epilepsy and then you'd want to start with versed so look at their history overall hey do they have they had this before and if they do if they have a history of epilepsy start with the versed see if that does the job generally versed is not going to resolve a eclamptic seizure and the 
um, magnesium that you would give for the eclamptic seizure is going to take longer anyway. So shoot the versed, see if that happens. If that doesn't uh, work, then go for the mag. All right, so syncope. Syncope can be caused by a number of different conditions. This is generally looked at as a sudden loss of consciousness, likely or typically associated with a reduction of blood flow to the brain temporarily uh, or you know reduction or interruption this is one of those self-correcting problems if their brain is not getting enough blood flow the body uh, the brain passes out the body collapses to the ground now everything's on an even plane and blood flow is restored to the brain so the brain wakes back up most of your syncopal episodes will recover uh, resolve very rapidly and so that's a good way to recognize like psychosyncope psychosyncope from a non-cardiac condition you know some psychiatric or you know emotional shock or something like that causes a person to pass out you know i saw the mouse uh, you know whatever that's going to resolve very quickly and so your that's a good way to rule out the possibility of a um cardiac event or some other concern you know drugs alcohol most other things like that those will um they will remain altered or confused for a period of time where psychosyncope rep um, recovers or resolves quite quickly so vasovagal is the form of syncope where they're bearing down too hard they uh massage their neck too much you know like choking around their neck or something like that, causing them to uh, slow their heart rate down, drop their blood pressure and pass out that way. Of course, you can have cardiogenic or cardiac related um, from arrhythmias. This is something that as patients get older, we want to be very cautious of and aware of, um, evaluate them carefully, run 12 leads. And in a uh, patient who has had a sinkable episode that cannot be otherwise explained, it's important to... Um, explain to them while they may not have a cardiac rhythm at this or an abnormal cardiac rhythm at this time the cause of their syncope may have been an abnormal rhythm that resolved on its own and could return in fact i've seen this a few different times where a patient uh had a syncopal episode at ems was called responded 12 leads were run everything was normal uh crew said well there's nothing wrong with your heart right now that we can see patient was um agreed to sign a refusal and then had a similar syncopal episode shortly thereafter decided to be transported that time that time during transport a vtac rhythm was noted during transport but again upon arrival at scene no abnormalities were noted so it's important to remember that you might not have the whole picture right now and it's uh, most cardiac events can only be ruled out through the uh, use of labs, blood, uh, blood draws, and continuous long-term monitoring. So if a patient has a syncopal episode that you can't explain, well, they've been sitting in their lawn chair in 95 degree weather drinking beer all day and they just stood up too fast and passed out or they've been... Um, you know, doing that neck, uh, binging Netflix on the couch or they're, uh, you know, some very clear this caused a, you know, hypo or um, orthostatic hypotension momentarily, you know, a dehydration or something like that. If you cannot rule that out, consider the cardiac event and recommend transport for evaluation because we're not going to be able to um, rule that out in the field. <laughs> All right, prodromal signs and symptoms. This is indications that this syncopal episode has greater uh, implications. You know, di they're still dizzy. Hmm. If it's a temporary syncope, most of your vasovagals or, you know, orthostatics, they're going to resolve really quick. But if your orthostatics are caused by general dehydration or loss of fluid volume, you know, blood volume, then you're going to remain dizzy. You might remain weak. Shortness of breath, chest pain, loss of vision or headache, these are all indications of a um, more significant underlying cause or in, where their um, weakness or syncopal likelihood of passing out is going to be continuous.
And for these patients, the emotional support that it's referring to would be relating to um, reassurance that not all syncopal episodes are a uh, necessarily caused by life-threatening concerns, that there are a number of different things that are easily t treated and corrected that can cause syncopal episodes. Um, so that kind of a reassurance, not letting them um, do the WebMD route and uh, determine that they're dying. All right, headaches are headaches are headaches. They suck. We don't like them. We have many, I'm sure all of us at one point or time, have treated a patient that is complaining of a headache while we ourselves had a very real headache. So a um, number of different causes for that. It is necessary, while it might seem frustrating, we, knew, we need to remember that everybody gets headaches and most people have had them, so therefore... If someone's calling 911, we need to figure out why. What is the what is new or unique or different about this headache versus previous headaches that have are um, caused you to want or need feel the need to call 911 this time? Um, try to narrow that down or try to rule out those concerns because a patient with a chronic headaches, you know, patient may have a history of migraines and suddenly pop an aneurysm and ha start having a brain bleed like that can happen just not associated so um simply having a history of migraines doesn't mean that this current headache is a migraine look for the co the uh, normal signs compare this migraine to pre or this headache to previous migraines did they have the same aura did they have the same um triggers and things like that um, muscle contractions can happen. Numbness and tingling can happen associated with it. So it is frustrating when you're trying to rule out a or the concern for a stroke when some headaches can result in these same type symptoms. And it's better to take it and say, you know what, you might be having a migraine, but you could be having a stroke. So let's treat you for the stroke and hope it's just a migraine. All right, um, so you can see several different causes of um, migraine headaches. Then there's the cluster headaches. Most people who have migraine and cluster headaches will have an aura. This is kind of like with a seizure. This is a um, indicator. It's a neurologic uh, warning sign that they're going to have a headache. Um, it can be a sound, it can be a smell, a taste, or a uh, visual disturbance, often like a flashing light or something, or loss of uh, peripheral vision or something along those lines. Uh, personally, if I get them, I'm going to have a, a blocked vision with a minimal or um, reduced visual field and have like dazzling lights. Um, I may also get a uh, abnormal taste or something in my mouth. And that's just uh, common to my my type of migraines or cluster headaches is what I get. The difference is a migraine, which are predominantly found in women, tend to be a longer lasting headache and it's like a individual event. Whereas a cluster, and it can be in the back of the head, the front of the head, can be, but it's going to be localized. A cluster headache almost is always a... Um, pain around one of the eyes and around that side of the face, you know, very localized to the front of the face. And now mine, they last four hours. So this is saying 30 to 45 minutes, but they can vary. And what you'll, a, but a common feature of cluster headaches is you'll have multiple of them within a short period of time. So I'll have several over a week, or you might have several within a day or something like that. All right, sinus headaches or sinus headaches, like right pressure in your head, tap on your forehead, it creates a significant increase in pain. Generally, it's indicating a sinus headache um, from congestion. Treat it for the congestion. Um, I had a guy one time tell me, called 911 because he couldn't breathe. Said he couldn't breathe, walked in, he's sitting there talking to me, O2 sets 100%, lung sounds clear and equal, absolutely no respiratory distress whatsoever. And I'm like, thought you said you couldn't breathe. And he said, yeah, I can't. And I'm like, what do you mean? You're, all your findings are fine. He's like, well, when I close my mouth, I can't breathe through my nose. I'm like, it's called nasal congestion. You have a head cold. Well, yeah, but I can't breathe through my nose. I'm like, so go below your nose. Like, 
you can but if you open your mouth you can breathe yeah like some people it is it should be noted you know has the patient had a change in medication are they is this headache the result of a recent you know a reaction to a medication if they started any new meds how are they um doing on fluid uh intake you know are they drinking enough water are they eating an ad adequate uh had adequate nutrition avoiding you know you know did they drink heavily the night before or use other drugs or chemicals that could create a hangover side effect you know trying to narrow it down from that standpoint uh, so ketolorac, uh, mepridine, these are great medications for dealing with, um, uh, these are NSAIDs, very effective for dealing with migraine, or not migraines, but headaches in general. Not a huge fan of fentanyl and morphine. I don't normally hand that out in the pre-hospital environment for the complaint of a headache. It's, um, first of all, for migraines and cluster headaches and some of those severe headaches it's not shown to be particularly effective in treating it whereas like aspirin caffeine and tylenol um tend to be much more effective um with that now um a lot of headaches can be severe enough to require um antiemetic or to result in nausea and require antiemetics so don't hesitate to uh, do that if necessary all right, so dementia. Let's talk a little about the dementia now. It's important to note that um, dementia is an umbrella diagnosis where, um, and it is differentiated from other forms of confusion and delirium because it is chronic. So as you can see, it is a chronic deterioration and resulting in a loss of identity or self-awareness or a loss of memory or a uh, change of personality, loss of judgment, things like this. And weeks to years, very long period of time, um, but this is an umbrella which multiple diseases fall under. Um, here are the two most common, <clears throat> Wernicke's encephalopathy, vitamin B1, and Alzheimer's. So let's talk about them um, a little bit. Dementia, excuse me, all right, Warnicke's encephalopathy. What does that? What does encephalopathy mean to us? What do, when we hear that word? How do we break that word down? What is encephalopathy? A hard, yeah, hard head. Okay. Um, all right. So very similar to hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is water in the brain caused by excessive cerebral spinal fluid. But encephalopathy is a swelling of brain tissue. Um, and, you know, it's fluid shifting into the neurons. As the fluid shifts into the neurons, the um, neurons swell up, lose their function, and there's an alteration in mental status and decision-making because the neurons don't function properly anymore. So that's what encephalopathy is. And there are a number of different conditions that can result in that encephalopathy. But Warnicke's specifically is caused by a vitamin B1 deficiency. Vitamin B1 is necessary in the conversion of glucose um, and oxygen into ATP. So as part of the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, you have to have vitamin B1 to make that process happen. It's one of the required nutrients. And it's required in fairly low quantities, but um, so we generally absorb enough vitamin B1 in our meals without having to do supplementation and such like that. Vitamin B1 absorption and function is very much dependent on liver enzymes, though, and on adequate liver function. So patients who are at risk of Wernicke's encephalopathy are patients who have liver failure, and most specifically patients who have liver failure due to excess alcohol consumption or chronic alcohol abuse. And generally, we're talking about the extreme alcoholics, not the you know, college kid who likes to drink a 24 pack of beer on a Thursday night kind of a thing. We're talking about the folks that drink clear liquor 
all the time and have for years in our significant or have basically ruined their liver for with it another common stereotype and i realize it is a stereotype to these alcoholics is the spending their money on the alcohol and not consuming any other form of nutrient so they're not eating adequately they're not even buying you know malt beverages or you know like heavy beers or whatever that are going to give them some calories so that's very low calorie low nutrient um uh, done, uh consumption so you know this is not going to happen to uh, a person who drinks um a lot of beer because most beers especially the stouter the beer the you know the darker the beer the more vitamins and such it's going to have in it um you know like the argument could be made guinness or beer you know dark stout beers like that can be used as like a meal replacement almost due to the quantity of calories and some of the nutrients in them so not necessarily recommending that but it's kind of exists nonetheless we're talking about people who drink hard liquor, no uh, nutri no other form of nutrition, and so they are now vitamin deficient. Then with the damage to the liver and the inability to then absorb that uh, vitamin B1 in the future can make it very hard out, oh, can lead to the chronic condition of encephalopathy. Warnicke's is not <clears throat> necessarily a one-time event so what happens why does it happen well if you don't have vitamin b1 to be able to process your glucose into atp the glucose will continue to enter the neurons because the neurons are like hey we need glucose we need atp where are you know send us more glucose so glucose enters a neuron and raises the basically the glucose level of the intracellular you know of, of the um, cytoplasm of the neuron this causes a fluid shift because osmosis is trying to maintain an equilibrium between the fluid the cytoplasm in the cell and the blood volume in the vessels and when the blood sugar or excuse me when the blood sugar level in the vessel is lower than the glucose level of the cytoplasm fluid is going to start shifting into the cytoplasm causing the swelling that's where the encephalopathy comes from you start swelling neurons they increase the pressure in the brain they release um result or, resulting in damaged brain cells and um ineffective brain cell function generally this can be treated not in a reverse the condition but in a alleviate the symptoms by administering vitamin b1 also known as thymine in the pre-hospital environment this is why when your patient is a known chronic alcoholic and hypoglycemic you want to consider giving thymine prior to giving the dextrose because it they it is anticipated that they have that problem if you were to give a hypoglycemic patient who has Warnicke's encephalopathy if you were to give them glucose without the thymine you would actually make their altered mental status and confusion worse because you would simply be adding to that fluid shift swelling those brain cells more resulting in more damaged brain cells than you previously had unfortunately once a patient develops Warnicke's Warnicke's will continue uh, for the rest of their life um, very difficult to treat these patients they require continual supplementation of vitamin B1 uh, generally through injections of some sort uh, that way it doesn't have to be absorbed through the GI tract um, so it takes the liver out of the concern of uh, the process and um, there is a good chance that they will have um, episodes of confusion or a form of permanent delirium there is a patient at the hospital that I've been doing my clinicals at uh, I've been at doing clinicals since um, August and She's been there the whole time. She has Warnicke's encephalopathy, and she is, you know, she done flew over the cuckoo's nest. Um, you'll be talking with her. Oh yeah, everything's great. Good morning. How are you? Yep, I'm hungry. I want to eat. And the next thing you know, she's trying to climb out of bed and get dressed because she has to go to a job interview. And then she's on her way to a wedding, or she's um, needs you to uh, call the police because her family is hiding outside of her window or something like that. And you're like, yeah, sure, okay. Um, and you just have to distract her, and she just jumps from one idea to another. And this is an example of that 
alteration of judgment and thought processes due to the permanent damage of Wernicke's. Now, Alzheimer's, similarly, another cause of dementia, this is also going to result in a loss of judgment, a loss of cognitive function, a change of personality, um, difficulty with memory, and things like that. Alzheimer's is a little bit different than old, um, what I like to call old timers, old timers being a... Um, simply a reduction in cognitive process with age not that you are losing the ability to think and make decisions but it takes longer it just takes a little more time to think through a process uh, or process thoughts so um and just you might have absent-mindedness or forgetfulness due to too much things too many things going on in your life well alzheimer's is a structural change of the brain matter itself the overall um, volume of the brain is reduced the neurons are being shrunk essentially the underlying cause is not well known um, there's a lot more information now than there was just a few years ago when i um, first started treating so, or teaching i mean so i'm not super familiar on what the newest uh, revelations are on Alzheimer's and what causes it. I haven't looked into it recently, uh, but it is a degenerative condition of the brain uh, previously thought to only be able to be diagnosed of, um, definitively after death through post-mortem autopsies because it was basically had to visualize the brain. Uh, the stuff I've seen of brains that had Alzheimer's, they shrivel up and look kind of more like an almond instead of that pinkish gray matter. Um, they are they get they have an alteration of color kind of start to turn brown they shrivel and shrink um in general size and that's associated with that decreased function so um you know that's what let's talk about here that the neurons die so what is the difference between dementia and delirium delirium is going to be temporary it is a short-term event caused by an acute problem can be resolved and the patient will return to their baseline dementia is a slow deterioration a loss of that mental uh, function it is irreversible and will continue to um, go essentially go downhill for that patient so especially in the early set um early onset of dementias or causes of dementia it can be just misconstrued as simply an old age um but like we've pointed out it needs to be um it is more significant than simple uh, memory loss the confusion the aggression those tend to be your hallmark signs now this person has got dementia most people who are confused are perfectly willing to accept yes i'm a little bit confused i forgot what i was doing where am i and you redirect them and everything's good patients who are developing dementia w often will um they refuse to acknowledge their confusion and tend to become a not have to be but oftentimes will become a violent violent or at least aggressive when you're trying to uh, correct their uh, thought processes or solve um, help fix their confusion never never miss the opportunity to or excuse me never ever miss an underlying cause or an alternate con uh, cause by not doing a complete uh, assessment blood glucose oxygen levels check for strokes cardiac monitor consider um, if other forms of blood chemistry can be um, evaluated look for that a really common cause or not i shouldn't say really common but an interesting one is elevated ammonia levels which you'll find in patients who have liver failure cirrhosis of the liver or have had a previous liver transplant and are now um having rejection of that liver that elevated ammonia level will prevent present very much like um the dementia because in a in a sense it is an encephalopathy and this is hepatic encephalopathy um caused specifically by elevated ammonia levels high ammonia levels in the blood shift into the brain cells or shifts ammonia into the brain cells which then pulls fluid with it causing the cells to swell you have swollen cells this is hepatic encephalopathy we'll talk more about that under the gi um segment but it is a uh, form and that results in a delirium because once you lower their their um, ammonia levels their um, delirium and confusion goes away 
All right. Um, I mentioned the thiamine already. Uh, you're going to do EKG monitoring for these patients because of the potential for other electrolyte imbalances to be present. Um, that's why it's recommending labs drawn, you know, sodium, potassium, chloride, phosphorus, that kind of stuff. All right. So neoplasms, cancer, right? Tumors within the brain. Um, we pointed out multiple times, you have brain, you have blood, you have cerebral spinal fluid in a sealed cranium that can't really change its shape. So you start growing a tumor in there and you're going to have a reduction of those other three substances or compression on the brain itself. Um, these can present a very similar to a stroke. Once they get severe, they tend to create headaches early on. Um, one of the very common indicating differences between a brain tumor and a stroke or brain bleed is brain tumors, while having the same complaints and presentation, develop much slower than a bleed. Metatastic means it was metastasized. It has started somewhere else in the body and has moved metastasizes to move or replant in another area of the body you'll see that almost like basically all of these symptoms are identical to a uh, intracerebral hemorrhage of some sort or intracranial hemorrhage, I suppose. Our biggest thing is to con uh, stop or treat seizures that may develop during our um, transport time, transporting them to an appropriate facility. And um, yeah, that's about it. All right, so demyelination, degeneration, motor neuron. So these are neurologic disorders that are going to affect the peripheral nervous system. These are not going to be within the central nervous system. Um, so we're, um, we're looking at things like multiple sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's, um, uh, Guillain-Barre, and such like that. Um, What is demyelination? This is a loss of the myelinin sheath, which is actually a glial cell. It's another type of cell that wraps around the axons of a, or ax, excuse me, axons of a nerve and um, assists with speeding up the transmission of the signal along that axon. Uh, degeneration, as you can see, um, would be the actual loss. So here's, an, here's a multiple sclerosis. This is a damaging or a um, loss or, well, it's not necessarily a loss of the myelin sheath. It is a damage to the myelin sheath. Um, demyelination is the term we use here. This is an autoimmune disorder that attacks the glial cell, the myelin cells, um, sheath cells that wrap around our axons of our motor neurons and sensory, excuse me, our peripheral nerves, because it can be both motor and sensory. And as a he as part of the healing process of that myelin sheath, the scar tissue is formed, and that scar tissue is going to interrupt the signal transfer. And so, a um, as you can see here, the signal is sent down this axon, and then jumps instead of continuing in a wave-like pattern along the. Um, axon it does a um, leapfrog along the axon across these myelin sheaths so <clears throat> and each of those points that it leapfrogs to is called a node of ranar um a ranvir excuse me not ranar a ranvir so that's how the signal will move very rapidly along these peripheral nerves um, you might see this in cranial nerves but you'll see it heavily in your peripheral nervous system. You do not see myelinated nerves in the brain or in the spinal cord. This is for nerves that have very long axons uh, and transmit, transmit signals over large portions of the body. Um, so early symptoms, blurred or double vision, nystagmus. This is because those cranial nerves are being affected by the um, demyelinization and then scar tissue forming. Um, the attacks and remissions here is the autoimmune, uh, the immune, because, oh gosh, because it is an autoimmune disorder, the immune cells will attack these myelin sheaths, cause the damage, create the scar tissue, alter nerve 
can function. And then that scar tissue will heal, the cells will be replaced, problem will be resolved. Now the neurons aren't going to be replaced, the axons, but your body will heal those um, myelin cells and then they will also learn the neuroplasticity to send the signal along a different cell instead of that one um, resulting in a um, regain a function to a so sort and that's why you can have these attacks and then remissions with multiple sclerosis it is predominantly found in women but it can be found in men muscle weakness speech disturbances again that um, cranial nerve function the inability to move the mouth um, the vertigo, again, cranial nerve. The electric sensation, this is from your sensory nerves, like your um, sen sensory nerves resulting in that stinging or burning, kind of like you would associate with sciatic pain or whatever, but it could be anywhere in the body. This can um, work with urinary nerves, make it very hard for a person to urinate or hard for them to maintain continence because they lose control of their pelvic floor um, motor neurons, they may lose sensitivity to their pelvic floor neurons, which can um, have a big impact in whether they know they need to urinate or um, things like that. So for us, we're going to uh, care for the patient supportively. There's not a lot we're going to do. Um, and this generally does not present a life-threatening injury, um, but our biggest concern would be did their weakness result in a fall or something like that. Um, most of the treatments are going to be aimed at reducing their or um, inhibiting, excuse me, immunosuppression to try to stop the audio, autoimmune reaction. All right, so Guillain-Barre. Guillain-Barre and ALS, um, amyotropic lateral sclerosis are very similar conditions. All right, so the biggest difference between the two is Guillain-Barre is recoverable. Not all patients will recover, but many patients with Guillain-Barre will uh, be able to recover and have a normal life afterwards. Um, so this is a um, condition that attacks where the, ooh, your immune system is the culprit, is attacking your peripheral nervous system. It generally results uh, very distally and then works progressively proximal to your body. Um, the biggest concern is when the nerve paralysis gets to the diaphragm and the phrenic nerve, and then the patient loses the ability to breathe. The lack of mobility, the loss of mobility, the being bed confined, the uh, diminished effort to breathe and such like that, that paralysis can lead to pneumonia. And the pneumonia is one of the most common killers of patients with both Guillain-Barre and ALS. Uh, of course, as you can imagine, with paralysis of the body and a loss of nerve function, you're going to have uh, changes of blood pressure and um, vital signs that can be as the body's trying to compensate. Um, this process can resolve in several months. Um, generally, I think it's like three to six months is the process, and that's assuming they don't require or acquire some form of infection that um, be, uh, is lethal or they become vent dependent and can't wean off the vent. So what are we going to do? Monitor their vitals, because if it's causing weakness to their diaphragm, we don't want them to become hypoxic as a result. You want to protect them from injury, uh, bed sores and things like that. Maintain that airway, um, as you can see. It's very, very um, simple from our standpoint to care. It's just monitor those vital signs. Um, ALS, on the other hand, which I mentioned, and we're going to see it here in a minute, is more permanent. Once ALS causes a loss of function of those nerves, there is, there is to date no regaining of that function. All right, uh, Parkinson's is a condition we'll see a more commonly with the elderly. This is a, um, the substantia nigra. Of course, this is a portion of the brain that produces dopamine. Dopamine plays a huge function in neuron control. Without that dopamine, we have a loss of neuron function. And it pres and in Parkinson's patients, it is presenting with that um, loss of motor control or that uh, erratic motor control. So the patient will develop the tremors in their hand that we're and a shuffling gait and things like that. These are the condition. Or these are the symptoms that we notice 
most commonly. So shuffling great bradykinesia, that slow movement, they have loss of posture, they have the tremors, or maybe even have muscle rigidity. Um, <clears throat> All right, so here's the amyotropic lateral sclerosis, often known as Lou Gehrig's. Um, again, voluntary motor neurons of the peripheral nervous system. Um, male patients, tend, middle-aged males, tend to be the most likely um, victims of this condition. Um, like I said, it presents very, very similar to a Guillain-Barre. Um, but is permanent. So, all right, cranial nerve disorders. This would be, uh, this could be Bell's palsy of the face. This could be tinnitus. This could be vertigo, Meniere's disease. This could be a change in your ability to move your tongue or something along those lines. So um, this is where there are no other central nervous system alterations. It is simply that cranial nerve has lost its function. These are almost never life-threatening. The biggest concern here would be if that nerve affected their gag reflex or the ability to protect their airway or the vertigo resulted in a fall and trauma, and then we're treating that trauma. If it is vertigo or Meniere, something along those lines, uh, treat the nausea. All right, so dystonia, this is a nervous condition where you have a cramping or contraction of the nerves. Generally, um, as you can see here, it can cause a very strange spasming or twitching. Um, it's not, we would often maybe refer to it like a tick, but where you're gonna have the patient who's like drawing up in a contorted manner where you're like, why are you moving your muscles that way? And it's um, not voluntary. It, um, you might have that shaking. You could see this a lot with patients who have cerebral palsy. It's very similar in those cases, but dystonia or dystonic reactions can result from other causes. One of the more um, less recognized is the reaction to certain medications. Um, patient has a reaction and the treatment then is to use diphenhydramine, Benadryl. So here's some examples of various types of dystonias. All right, so this is your encep um, encephalitis and meningitis. Encephalitis is going to be the infection of the brain of the neurons themselves, whereas meningitis is the infection of the meningeal lining around the central nervous system, both brain and spinal cord. This is a, a very um, straightforward infection. It could be viral or it can be bacterial. In fact, there are some examples of, um, of it being protozoa. Um, some form of organ, another form of organism, but generally they're bacterial or viral. Incidentally, bacterial meningitis is the one that is um, contagious, whereas viral meningitis is almost never contagious because the viral meningitis isn't the virus got into the meninges, is the viral infection existed elsewhere and the, the infection has now, inflammation has now spread into the meninges. Generally, it's some form of upper respiratory infection, viral infection that goes into the meninges. So viral meningitis, um, generally not considered contagious, bacterial meningitis is considered contagious in the field we will not know the difference between the two um, so we'll treat them all as if they are a bacterial meningitis which requires um, very careful um, PPE precautions you want to use negative pressure rooms you want to um, make certain that the patient and you are both wearing N95s to prevent the transfer of the bacteria um, be and then um, monitor their um, vital signs and limit the number of patients who are, excuse me, not patients, providers who have contact with the patient. So, of course, you'll have fevers. There'll be the alteration of mental status and men brain functions. So there you go with the hallucinations, delusions, um, that kind of stuff. Um, 
So um, here's some causes, whether it's endo or exotoxins resulting in the meningitis. It is. Um, it can result in um, the Kernig sign and the Brudzinski's sign, Kernig's being the inability to straighten the leg when it's raised, or the Brudzinski's when you lift the legs or their head, one or the other, the other moves. So generally it's you lift the head up and the knees draw up, or you lift the legs up and the head lifts forward. And that's because of the tightening of the um, inflammation of the meninges, swelling when you move something, it triggers those nerves to activate. Um, so those are your, um, the, Brzezinski's sign should not be considered with Brzezinski's reflex, which is about the, um, the ex contraction or extension of the toes on a baby. Seizures can happen. Um, Meningitis needs to be treated very aggressively and very early on, so this is an emergency. The patient needs to be transported um, immediately. Uh, time of onset or last known normal is very important here. Um, they're probably going to do spinal taps and such like that to identify the bacterium um, for culture and sensitivity. Uh, but it can also be lethal, so um, and it doesn't take very long. I'm familiar with a case within my family, my extended family, where uh, a guy, uh, you know, a cousin had uh, been at the fire academy on Friday, uh, didn't feel really well Friday afternoon and evening, said, you know, he was going to go home and go to bed and hopefully feel better by Monday morning, didn't show up for class Monday morning. Uh, by Monday afternoon or um, late Monday morning, early afternoon, they sent out a search party because he wouldn't answer his phone. They found him dead in his room um, from meningitis. Or actually, he was in a coma from the meningitis and died the next day in the ICU. He, he was not dead when they found him, but he died within just a matter of days. So meningitis can be a very rapidly developing condition. If you treat a patient and have exposure, they may give you antibiotics prophylactically. All right, let's take a quick break, stretch your legs, wake up, and uh, before we finish this chapter. All right, so abscesses within the uh, central nervous system. Very... Well, not the same as um, meningitis or an infection of the meninges, which is spread throughout the meninges, meningeal linings. Abscesses are going to be localized just like they would be in the skin or anywhere else on the body, where you have a localized pocket of inflammation, of infectious material resulting in pus and all that, where the immune system is trying to isolate the um, invading bacteria or something. This can come from trauma or something along those lines, and uh, but it will often result in a continued swelling or growth of that abscess that can result in pressure and other uh, problems. It's kind of presenting the way a uh, tumor would or something like that. So. Big difference between a t uh, recognizing the tumor and recognizing the absence is abscesses. Abscesses are preceded by infection of some sort. They will be associated with a fever, then the headache developing, and so on and, on and so forth. But otherwise, it's going to look and you're going to treat it very similarly to a uh, tumor or even a meningitis to a degree. All right, polio, is that a question? It's like um, Athens camera went kakook. So. Um, but anyway, uh, polio, excuse me, Polio and polio, post-polio syndrome, well, we don't see polio very much anymore. It's an infection, um, viral infection, as you can see, fecal oral, uh, which is probably a huge part of why we don't see um, 
we don't see it very often um, due to improved hand hygiene and such like that. Um, excuse me. It can cause a loss of neural function to motor, um, excuse me, motor nerve function to skeletal muscles. Some of the more dramatic cases that are going to involve like lower extremities and such like that simply because it, it, of the loss of mobility. It was commonly fatal when it involved the diaphragm uh, and um, which obviously caused the patient not to be able to breathe. If you're uh, interested in the history of it, they used a device called the iron lung, which is basically like a vacuum container that the patient would be placed in with their head exposed. The rest, their, the entire body was inside this uh, con capsule, more or less, and it would pull a vacuum, creating a negative pressure ventilation. So the patient could continue to breathe without having to be intubated, and uh, but they would be living in that iron lung. Now, sometimes it would only be for a temporary um, short period of time to help supplement the breathing because they did have some ability to breathe on their own, but then would fatigue easily and be placed back into the um, iron lung. I was reading an article recently where there is still a patient here, in, a woman here in the United States who is using an iron lung and um, is in it most of the day uh, to breathe. I don't recall where, but this is interesting that it's still a holdover from the polio days. Post-polio syndrome is the permanent muscle weakness or loss of, loss of muscle control. As a result, these patients are going to be wheelchair bound or wear braces and need crutches and things like that. So uh, while the symptoms of the infection itself are like unlikely for us to see, not a huge concern here. Again, it's going to present much like any viral uh, infection but then have that muscle weakness and paralysis. The post polio is going to have uh, the issues with uh, mobility and swallowing and things along those lines. So part of the problem may be a reduction in uh, nutrition or dehydration or something like that because they weren't eating or drinking uh, adequately and leading uh, due to their weakness or illness. All right, peripheral, peripheral neuropathy. This can be caused by several different things. The most common cause is diabetes. We'll learn more about diabetes in a future chapter. But um, another cause could be chemotherapy. Generally, post-chemo uh, neuropathy is, or any other form of toxin, toxin-induced neuropathy is going to be temporary, of course, but autoimmune and other conditions can cause it as well. This generally results in a reduction, excuse me, when activation of sensory nerves resulting in a whole lot of pain, uh, especially on onset, but it can involve motor neurons and ultimately lead to a loss of sensation and um, not so much a paralysis but a um, lack of feeling like a complete numbness uh, where you see this in diabetics and such like that they'll injure themselves and have no idea they injured themselves in the periphery like in their hands or feet uh, because they have no sensation whatsoever Uh, gabapentin is probably the most common medication used, also known as Neurontin. Uh, it's probably one of the most common medications used to treat neuropathy. Patients that I've known that have been on gabapentin and Neurontin for ex any period of time generally do not like the medication. They don't like the way it makes them feel, but it becomes this catch-22 of symptom side effects of gabapentin or burning nerve pain. So that was that chapter there. Like I said before, there really wasn't a lot left in um, neuro, uh, neurologic emergencies. So.